Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcicki. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us today. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media and Latinx communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in that space. Gillian Baez is an associate professor of Africana and Puerto Rican Latino studies at Hunter College in the City University of New York. Celeste Wagner, a doctoral candidate at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media will introduce Gillian in just a minute. I'm delighted to know also that today's talk is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Program, and the Latina and Latino Studies Program, all at Northwestern University. Before we go to the seminar, I'd like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Free Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and involvement efforts. Let me briefly say how the seminar will unfold. First, Celeste will tell us more about Gillian's research and career in just a minute. Then Gillian will deliver her seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar and Celeste will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Celeste, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Pablo, for the introduction and Mora Matassi and Facundo Suenzo who are behind the scenes for inviting me to moderate today's seminar. It's a real honor to introduce Professor Gillian Baez today and be here with all of you through the screen. Dr. Gillian Baez is an associate professor in the Africana and Puerto Rican Latino Studies Department at Hunter College, City University of New York. Professor Baez received her PhD in communications from the Institute of Communications Research at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research lies at the intersection of Latinx media and popular culture, transnational feminisms, and issues of belonging and citizenship. Dr. Baez's research has also been published in numerous peer-reviewed journals, including Critical Studies in Media Communication, Communication, Culture, and Critique, Women's Studies Quarterly, and Chicana Latina Studies. Professor Baez is the author of a really wonderful book that intersects in a very original way, theories of citizenship, particularly cultural citizenship and ethnographic audience reception studies with a focus on Latina audiences. The book is titled In Search of Belonging, Latinas, Media and Citizenship. For this book, Professor Baez received the prestigious Bonnie Reader Award for Outstanding Feminist Book at the National Communication Association in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gillian Baez. Thank you so much, Celeste, and thank you so much um, for having me today. It's so wonderful to be able to share my work among such an amazing community of scholars. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides.
So today's talk is based on some newer research that I'm doing, building on some of the issues that I touch on in the book that Celeste was talking about. My overall research has looked at issues of belonging across different forms of Latina Latino media. Um, and I look at both questions of, of content and also reception. In my book, In Search of Belonging, Latinas, Media, and Citizenship, I foreground the ways that Latina audiences engage with Latina, Latino-oriented media in an effort to gauge their place within the nation. In particular, my research indicates that Latina audiences attempt to navigate and negotiate Latina, Latino representation in relation to or against both dominant US and Latin American racial and ethnic hierarchies. In particular, early in the book, I trace how Latina audiences map belonging onto the, La the mediated Latina body in what I call a form of neo-mestizaje, a re-envisioning of their racial identities that sometimes stand in stark contrast to media representations available to them. Some of the participants that I talk about in this study noted the, marginaliz the marginalization of indigenous and black La Latinas and Latinos in both English and Spanish language media. Overall, most of the women in the study expressed that the representation of Latinas in both English and Spanish language media systems is Eurocentric and does not reflect the racial diversity of the Latina Latino community. These participants recognize the trappings of narrow definitions of Latinidad and instead crave media representations that were more heterogeneous and inclusive of not only mixed mestiza, indigenous and European and mulata, African and European bodies, um, and to a lesser extent that are also um, very much aware of Middle Eastern and Asian migration to Latin America, but also specifically black and indigenous bodies in order to disrupt colorism inherent in transnational media that circulates throughout the hemisphere. My book was published in 2018 and later that year, the hashtag Latinidad is canceled went viral on Twitter. One example that reflects the sentiment of the hashtag is this post, this tweet by Luis Carrera, who says, Latinidad is too diverse racially to be homogenized into one overarching moniker for identification. Speaking the same language doesn't make us kin. Some of our ancestors were tortured and forced to learn the language. Hashtag Latinidad is canceled. It is within this context today, I examine the representational work and institutional reception of two contemporary Latina transnational icons singer actress Amara La Negra on the left and actress Yalitza Aparicio on the right that identify respectively as black and indigenous. Through analysis of both women's engagement in English language and Spanish language media outlets, I argue that Amara La Negra and Yalitza Aparicio disrupt the dominant trope of racial ambiguity circulating in transnational media representations of Latina womanhood. In doing so, both women perform both legible and illegible representational labor across the Americas. Following a larger trajectory of activism across the Americas, celebrities Amara La Negra and Yalitza Aparicio, Afro-Latina Dominican, in the case of Amara La Negra, an indigenous Mexican, in the case of Yalitza Aparicio, both are vocal and deliberate in bringing attention to the erasures within Latino and Latin American media representations across the hemisphere. Studies of Latina Latino representation in both English language and Spanish language media indicate that Latinos are depicted as culturally, linguistically, and racially homogenous. In this rendering of Latinidad, Black and Indigenous communities have been severely marginalized in media almost to the point of complete erasure. And here I have just two examples to give you a visual sense of the kinds of erasures that I'm talking about. And here is, um, you know, in, in the context of Spanish language um, print media. Um, and here I have uh, placed a few photos 
of icons within US Latino media, um, such as on the, uh, you'll see Sofia Vergara on the left, who is someone actually who has crossed Spanish language media first into English language media and, and has crisscrossed in many ways, Jennifer Lopez, um, and also, um, you know, younger audiences will recognize Selena Gomez. Scholars have documented the systematic erasure and marginalization of Black and Indigenous bodies in Latina, Latino-oriented media culture. Reception research also indicates that Latina, Latino audiences are disappointed and frustrated by this symbolic annihilation in both English and Spanish language media. It is within this media landscape that cultural workers like Amara La Negra and Yalitza Aparicio attempt to intervene in disrupting the symbolic racial order. This presentation provides two entries into broadening visual and sonic constructions of Latinidad in global media. I do so by examining the representational work and institutional reception of these two contemporary transnational icons vis-a-vis -vis cross media analysis. Feminist media scholars have established that news and entertainment media rely on a woman as sign trope as a form of shorthand under this trope, women's bodies become icons and symbolically stand in for the nation, values, and particular communities. Extending the woman assigned trope, Latina media studies scholars, such as Anjara Valdivia, Isabel Molina Guzman, and Maria Elena Cepeda, demonstrate that contemporary Latina icons function as arbiters of Latinidad. In Latino and Latin American media, both past and present, Latina bodies stand in for nation building projects anchored in ideologies of mestizaje, racial mixture, and neo-mestizaje that at once celebrate racial mixture while also privileging whiteness. In order to understand Latina womanhood or Latinaness and how it is being reworked in transnational media, particularly in terms of race, I conducted a cross-media analysis that charts Amara La Negra's and Aparicio's iconicity in various media forms and platforms. Both Amara La Negra and Yalitza Aparicio are icons of Latinx Blackness and indigeneity, respectively in both US and Latin American media. This cross-media analysis therefore critically engages with Amara La Negra's and Aparicio's promotional videos, media interviews, press reception, and social media posts. These texts provide insight into the women's self-fashioning about race and gender and, in, in, and institutional reception vis-a-vis -vis media interviews. In doing so, I untangle how, how Amara La Negra and Aparicio labored to make their race and, and gendered identities legible in, English, in US English language and transnational Spanish language media. This study is grounded in a Latina feminist media studies approach with its hallmark attendance to transnational flows and identities. The analysis is also informed by Latinx critical, by a Latinx critical indigeneities approach and Afro-Latina feminisms, theoretical frameworks not previously deployed together in feminist media studies. Maylee Blackwell, Florida Alma, Bodge Lopez and Luis Urieta Jr conceptualize Latinx critical indigeneities, open quote, as an interdisciplinary analytic that reflects how indigeneity is defined and constructed across multiple countries and at times across overlapping colonialities, end quote. In a similar decolonizing vein, Afro-Latina feminisms illustrate the, the erasure of Afro-Latinas in not only mainstream feminist theory, but also within Chicana Latina and Black feminist theory. Um, and this is evident in the work of uh, scholars such as Zaydez Vinci Flores, Marisa Quinones Rivera, Omari Zamora, and the Black Latinas Know Collective. Placing Latina feminist media studies in conversation with Latinx critical indigeneities and Afro-Latina feminisms reveals the Eurocentric hegemony latent in knowledge produced in Latina feminisms and overall complicates the sanitized expression of Latinidad in the public sphere. Furthermore, when Latina Latino media studies scholars do foreground race in their scholarship, they very seldom position Black and Indigenous representations in dialogue with one another. In other words, most scholarship in this area either examines Afro-Latinos or Indigenous Latino depictions. 
Drawing from the relational approach developed by Tiffany Lethabo King, where she hones in on the spaces where Black and Native experiences rub up against each other. In this project, I contemplate on how Blackness and indigeneity are reworking hegemonic, no hegemonic constructions of Latinidad in both overlapping and diverging ways. In doing so, I underscore the linkages between the erasure and symbolic violence on Black and Indigenous women, while acknowledging the representational and material work these women do to intervene in transnational racial scripts that devalue Blackness and indigeneity. I argue that Amara la Negra and Aparicio, as mentioned earlier, disrupt this dominant trope of racial ambiguity prevalent in transnational media representations of Latina womanhood. These two figures engage in what Isabel Molina Guzman calls symbolic ruptures, whereby they critique hegemonic racial ideologies embedded in colonial regimes via their self-fashioning in media. This presentation and also the larger essay upon which I'm drawing on for this talk also doc documents how Amara, La Negra, and Aparicio are received by various media outlets. In order to register how their representations are received within sometimes overlapping racial formations. In analyzing the women's self-fashioning and their institutional reception, I demonstrate that Amara La Negra and Aparicio perform both legible and illegible labor because while their presence and activism broadens the contours of how Latinidad is depicted, their messages are deemed illegible or threatening depending on the media context. In particular, within English language media, they are deemed as, exot as the exotic foreign other, while in Spanish language media, their claims to blackness and indigeneity are, are either outright refused or ridiculed. Born Diana Danelis de, de Los Santos in 1990, Amara La Negra is a singer and actress of Dominican, ascent from, of Dominican descent from Hialeah, a predominantly Latinx area of the larger Miami metropolis. Amara La Negra is an iconic popular figure that cuts across English language and Spanish language markets across the Americas. Amara La Negra has a long-standing presence in Spanish language media as a former child cast member of the world's longest running variety show, Sábado Gigante. In the US context, she is best known as a cast member of VH1's reality series, Love and Hip Hop Miami. Latino and Latin American audiences will also recognize Amara La Negra as a reggaeton and pop singer. Of course, Amara La Negra is not the only Afro-Latina celebrity to achieve hemispheric popularity. For example, she sits in the company of iconic salsa queen, Celia Cruz, actress Zoe Saldana, and news anchor Ilya Calderon. However, Amara La Negra always positions herself as part of the African diaspora, a move that marks her distinctly as Black and departs from earlier representations of Afro-Latinas that sidestep race or move closer towards discourses of racial ambiguity so prevalent in Latin America and Latinx media. In this way, Amara La Negra dismantles the hegemonic brown aesthetic, a visual trope that Rachel Afi Quinn argues is, open quote, a non-threatening blackness that appeals to white beauty standards, end quote. Visually, Amara La Negra is a dark-skinned and voluptuous woman who often sports an Afro and form-fitting clothing in media interviews, music videos, and her social media posts. In both English language and Spanish language media, Amara La Negra is known for proudly embracing her blackness. In media interviews and on the STARS media platforms, Amara La Negra consistently identifies herself as Afro-Latina, as someone who is Black from Latin America and is part of the larger African diaspora. When making claim these claims to Blackness, Amara La Negra also affirms her Latinidad. For example, in media interviews, such as this one from NPR Code Switch, she regularly unabashedly proclaims that she is both Black and Latina. Um, and in this interview, she says, Movies, novelas, you know, soap operas, magazine covers, commercials, whatever the case may be, you barely ever, ever see people that look like myself. And there's people like me in every Latin country. So it's like you're talking to the Latino community, but why aren't you talking to people that look like me? What's the problem with me? Why am I not a good representation of what a Latino or Latina should look like? 
Due to her location within two marginalized identities, Amara La Negra simultaneously experiences erasure and her authenticity is regularly questioned in both English, including Black African American outlets and Spanish language media. And I wanna show you a clip that demonstrates how Amara La Negra talks about how she perceives herself, but also how she's received in US English language media. So I'm gonna stop the share for just a moment on the slide so that I can now share with you the YouTube clip. To be here, so thank beautiful. you. Yes. Oh, you guys Stunning, so oh my you. goodness. Yes, gosh. Hi welcome. guys, I'm so happy to yes. be here. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Okay, so how did you come up with your stage name, Amara? La Negra, did I say it right? Yes, Amara, yes. Amara. Yes. Amara. Amara. Okay, okay, so I used to be in a girl group and the group was called Amara. Okay. Unfortunately, one of the girls fell in love, you know how it is. <laughs> so um, the group fell apart and I stayed with the name Amara. Okay. Um, and then La Negra, because a lot of people didn't remember my name. So they would be like, ¿Cómo se llama La Negrita? What's La Negrita's name? What's the black <laughs> yeah. girl's name? And then Amara La Negra just kind of stuck. Okay. But at the same time, I, I guess that I kind of <laughs> kept La Negra because I was being rebellious. Because, you know, people are like, oh, don't, don't say La Negra because it sounds racist. But I am black and I love it, so what's the problem? <laughs> okay. I love that. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Crazy thing is it. that you've actually been criticized in the press for calling yourself Afro-Latina. So please, for the people, explain what that term means. <laughs> Jesus, here we go again. <laughs> Listen okay. up, take notes. Here we go again. Well, basically, um, I am Afro-Latina. I was yes. born and raised in Miami, but my parents are Dominican. Okay. And then the Afro part means I come from, Af from African descent. I, okay. As you can obviously see, I'm black. But my culture and, and my family and everything, we're, we're Latinos, we're huh. Dominican. So I guess a lot of people get confused with the term, what an Afro-Latino is. It just means that I'm black, but I'm Latina. You yeah, ready? There you go. <laughs> what a concept. Oh my God. A lot of people don't know that everyone from the Caribbean has African roots. Everyone from que son caribeño, we right. all have African roots. That's where roots. the slave ships, they first started there you over go. there. So, and yeah. we have so much, like so many different shades in my yeah. family. Um, I, my mom's like probably a little bit darker than you mm -hmm. are, but my father is very, very dark skinned. And we come in so many different shades yes. and, and sh shapes. And yeah. you know, this is just how Caribbeans are. Yes. So it's, it's unfortunately, unfortunate here in the United States sometimes, because people don't get exposed to seeing, or yes. 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 sometimes don't yeah. really get to understand. That's why we have this show, because we want to show all... Let's teach y'all. Educate yes. people. Yes. You know? people. Yes. What do yes. you say to people that say you're pretending to be black? Yes! <laughs> I've been told that I do blackface. <gasps> I take melanin shots to be black. Wow. I, uh, oh I tan, goodness. all types of crazy stuff. Um, and I think that's a big issue where people kind of get confused is that when you tell a Latino yeah. that uh, you are black, sometimes the confusion comes in when usually you know that black is African-American, uh, Caucasian is white, yeah. mm -hmm. and everything else, you're Latino. So you're like, no, I'm not black, I'm Latino. But mm -hmm. I, it's stupid to have to explain my color because you can see it. Yes. I don't have to say I am right. black, you see it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where the confusion comes in. And but... you know what? It's a beautiful color. So I Okay, I'm gonna stop the share here so we can get back into the slides. Okay. Amara La Negra's self-affirmation as an Afro-Latina performs two kinds of labor. First, she, is in, she inserts herself into US blackness. In her analysis of an interview on the African-American radio show, The Breakfast Club, where the whole Charlemagne questions Amara La Negra's blackness, Arlene Fernandez argues that US black popular culture functions as a hegemonic global blackness whereby blacks re read as non-American have to prove their authenticity. Um, and in this clip, and this is from a daytime uh, talk show, The Real, Amara La Negra is, is speaking back specifically to that interview and a number um, of, other, of, of other coverage um, of her identity in, in English language media. During this interview on The Breakfast Club and on social media discussion, Amara La Negra is asked to prove that her skin color and hair texture are not manufactured. This questioning may stem from concerns over Black co-optation, 
but they also render blackness as a singular mode of performance that silence Afro-Latina experiences both in the US and Latin America. Second, in terms of the kind of labor that Amara la Negra performed, she does the difficult work of reaching across language market boundaries in order to denounce racism within Latina Latino communities and connect Latina Latino audiences to black issues. Um, and we don't have time to look at this closely today, um, but she has quite a bit of uh, social media posts, for example, um, trying to uh, calling on the Latino community to recognize um, issues raised within the larger Black Lives Matter movement. In doing so, her body serves as a crossroads for Black and Latina Latino political struggles. Her labor is multiple, as it is illegible to segments of her audience that cannot fully understand the tapestry of her intersectionality. It should be noted that while Amara La Negra is very invested in destabilizing categories of Blackness and Latinidad, she often does so while simultaneously invoking tropicalized tropes of the Black female body. And I do go into this elsewhere um, in the larger essay that this is a part of. Um, but what I want to highlight here is that issues of labor inform these hypersexual representations. In her analysis of Black women on reality television, Raquel Gates sheds light on the opportunities reality TV affords cast members for personal and economic autonomy for performing ratchet representations of disreputable femininity. While these representations of Black womanhood can certainly be read as problematic, we cannot divorce the labor issues that constrain women's choices within media industries. More specifically, Vixa Ramirez argues that Amara La Negra's reprisal of the hypersexual Black woman is strategically performative. Amara La Negra visually deploys hypersexuality in her music videos and concerts, but in interviews and social media, she talks about herself as a desexualized daughter. She often brings up her mother in her interviews um, and is a self-identified homebody. The Spitfire is an archetype commonly utilized by Latina performers to gain more visibility and legibility in media. Angela Valdivia draws attention to the fact that there's a long history of Latina entertainers performing the Spitfire as a form of entry-level work. Using the examples of Salma Hayek, Rita Moreno, and Sofia Vergara, um, and certainly uh, Lupe Velez, uh, Valdivia demonstrates that it is through the Spitfire that Latinas not only gain entry into broader roles, both in front of and behind the camera, but also established long lasting careers. Amara La Negra fits squarely into this Latina Spitfire genealogy, but also navigates the added baggage of, of racialized tropes of Black women in Latin America. At the same time, Amara La Negra's hypersexual performances, particularly in her music videos and social media posts, can not only be read as neoliberal publicity. Ramirez reminds us that Amara La Negra's embrace of hypersexuality disrupts Dominican normative femininity and respectability and contends that building on the work of Carolyn Cooper on uh, Caribbean music and, and female sexuality, um, Ramirez re uh, offer, uh, argues that Amara La Negra offers up a bottom-up performance of Dominican and Afro-Latinx pride. Instead of merely viewing Amara La Negra as reproducing tired and demeaning representations of Black women's sexuality, Ramirez instead invites us to view Amara La, La Negra as a prismatic figure that grafts new possibilities of Black women's sexuality onto familiar tropes. Amara La Negra's efforts to bring attention to the experiences of Afro-Latinas are not only met with the policing of her Blackness within African-American media spaces, but also with overt backlash in some of the Spanish language media sphere. In the Dominican, in, in Dominican media, in the Dominican media, Amara La Negra was ridiculed for sporting an Afro and her overt celebration of blackness. For example, in 2016, Geisha Montes de Ojo, the 2008 Miss World, uh, which she won as Miss Dominican Republic, performed in blackface during a comedy skit on the Dominican Republic's Aquí se habla español, a variety show that airs in the Dominican Republic and is later streamed on YouTube to reach diasporic viewers. Um, and I have inserted a still image from um, that particular segment. In the skit, Montes de Oca performs as a Mara La Negra wearing an Afro wig and butt pad. This example taken alongside the US interviews discussed earlier 
point to the ways that Amara la Negra registers differently in English and Spanish language media. Amara la Negra is either read as not black in English language media or as too black in Spanish language media. Overall, the case of Amara la Negra's institutional reception is demonstrative of the liminal space Afro-Latinas occupy in transnational media. Of Mistec and Triqui lineage, Yalitza Aparicio was born in 1993 in Oaxaca. Aparicio entered the global stage in her film debut role in Alfonso, in Alfonso Cuaron's Academy Award-winning drama Roma, released in 2018. In her role as Clio, a Mistec domestic worker in 1970s Mexico City, Aparicio was nominated for an Oscar award for Best Actress. Aparicio is the first indigenous woman from the Americas to receive an Oscar nomination and the second Mexican woman after Salma Hayek for her role in Frida in 2002 to be nominated for this award. In 2020, Aparicio was inducted into the Hollywood Academy, the organization that votes for Oscars awards. Prior to her role in Roma, Aparicio was a preschool teacher with no aspirations to become an actress. As of 2019, Aparicio serves as a UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Indigenous Peoples. Glossing the covers of magazines like Vanity Fair and W Magazine and making Time Magazine's 100 list in 2019, Aparicio made an impact both on Hollywood and amongst Latino and Latin American audiences hungry for more representations of Indigenous peoples. She also is active on her social media accounts, especially Instagram and YouTube, where she melds her experiences in Hollywood and her activism concerning indigenous and domestic worker rights. In these ways, Aparicio crosses the boundaries between spectacular and ordinary bodies. In her op-ed in the New York Times, which was released um, in 2020, she describes the significance of her role in Roma as the following, open quote, as a child, I couldn't relate to the people I saw on movie screens. The actors and actresses were nothing like the people I knew, and their stories centered on worlds far away from my own." End quote. Aparicio's role as Cleo, and, and here you can see a still image of Aparicio playing Cleo, received mixed reception amongst critics and audiences. On the one hand, Cleo was celebrated for her visibility in the film, while on the other hand, the character, the character was narratively overdetermined, having little agency over her life circumstances. Chicana Chicano and Indigenous Studies scholar Gabriela Spears Rico notes Aparicio's visual agency, despite her narrative oppression in Roma. In this quote, Aparicio also illuminates the impact of the film. She says, she writes, open quote, I never thought that a movie alone could prompt social awareness and change. But when the director Alfonso Cuaron re released his film Roma in 2018 with me in the lead role, that's exactly what happened. Suddenly people in my home country of Mexico were talking about issues that have long been taboo here. Racism, discrimination toward indigenous communities, and especially the rights of domestic workers, a group that has been historically franchised in Mexican society. Here Aparicio talks about the impact of the film beyond entertainment for viewers by creating space for necessary conversations about discrimination toward indigenous communities. Following Roma's release, one of the major touch points that secured Aparicio's ascendance to global recognition was the January 2019 cover of Mexico. In the essay, I do analyze this, this cover in more depth. Um, but here, take note of the visual signifiers that graph both the traditional and the modern onto Aparicio's body. In an accompanying short video to the cover produced by Vogue, uh, there is a link made between her fictional role as Cleo to the realities of gender colorism in contemporary Mexico. And I'm going to stop the share for a moment again um, to show you that clip on YouTube. Hablemos de mí. Del papel que interpreto en una película que refleja la realidad. 
hablemos de mujeres reales, con nostalgias, recuerdos, pasiones y una identidad que se ve y se siente a flor de piel. Mi piel, muy mexicana, oaxaqueña y muy humana, del color de mi tierra y la diversidad de sus colores. Luces, cámaras, alfombras rojas, portadas, es por esperanza, por realzar el nombre del lugar de origen, por inspirar. Creo que lo más bello que te puede pasar en Navidad es trascender a través de las personas, no de uno mismo. Mi nombre es Yalitza Paricio Martínez y estoy en la portada de Vogue. Una mujer normal, fuerte, como todas las demás, está logrando ser inspiración para otras personas. A pesar de algunos obstáculos, ha seguido luchando por lo que sueña. Cuando estaba pequeña, soñaba en ser tantas cosas. Entre ellas fue el ser maestra de preescolar. Esta etapa de los niños donde les puedes ayudar a soñar más alto y a seguirlos motivando. Siempre he sido una persona muy apegada a mi familia. Todo el tiempo estoy pensando en qué están haciendo o cómo están. Mi mamá me decía, no puedo creer que estés ahí frente a tanta cámara, hablando con tantas personas, cuando yo no te podía tomar ni una foto porque llorabas o te asustabas. Tenían que estar mi familia alrededor cuidando que yo no corriera. En un principio solamente lo hice por contarle a mi hermana en qué consistía un casting. Jamás imaginé que iba a quedar seleccionada. Cuando me preguntaban, respondía, pues no sé si quedé o no, pero yo estoy feliz porque fui a conocer algún lugar o llevé a mi mamá a pasear. Cuando estuve por primera vez en el set, era algo tan diferente. Olvidar que estaban todos alrededor, sobre todo que estaba la cámara. Sentir a todo el equipo que estaba ahí como mi familia me ayudó demasiado. Un sueño que nunca soñé. Estoy muy agradecida por todas estas oportunidades que he tenido de conocer a muchas personas. Y sobre todo, estar recorriendo todas estas partes del mundo con una historia tan bella como es la película Roma. Se están rompiendo ciertos estereotipos de que solamente personas con cierto perfil pueden aspirar a estar en una película o estar en una portada de revista que están conociendo estas otras caras de México. Es algo que me hace tan feliz y orgullosa de mis raíces. Cada cosa que ha formado parte de mi vida me ha ayudado a llevarme hasta este lugar. Nunca te podrías deslindar de tu origen. El hecho de que yo olvidara eso sería olvidar quién soy. Mi misión es seguir adelante, seguir luchando. Siento que será como la oportunidad para tantas personas de llegar a lo que quieren. I'm just bringing the slides back up. Okay. So in both the Vogue cover and the accompanying video that I just showed you, Aparicio visually straddles the dichotomy between tradition and modernity, a role regularly assigned to the few indigenous women that achieve national and global recognition and bear the burden of representation of all indigenous people. And this is very similar to the ways in which Rigoberta Menchu was received by the English language press, um, an, issue, an issue that Anjarad Valdivia has written about. In addition, unlike the servitude that is usually associated with indigenous and Latina bodies, in the US version of Vogue, and also um, in terms of thinking about Aparicio's role in Roma, the cover offers a temporary disruption of the power-laden relationships in the Americas that relegate indigenous women to tradition and domesticity. Aparicio is neither hypersexualized nor does she don extremely modest attire. Instead, she is styled with a mix of high and folk fashion thus hearkening to the larger commodification of ethnic textiles for global consumption that Boatima Boateng has written about. Ultimately, both the image and copy on the Vogue cover, um, and I am not sure if on your end how clearly you can see the smaller copy, um, but up on the left-hand corner where it says Yalitza Aparicio, we see in Spanish, una estrella ha nacido. Underneath that, we have the translation of a star is born um, in Misteco. 
um, which, which really it, it marks um, an important moment in terms of thinking about language within Vogue, Mexico. Um, and these mark a symbolic rupture, um, the visuals here in the copy, um, in terms of thinking about the visual economy of Latin American indigenous women within media. Sign signaling perhaps beginning changes in, Latin, in the Latin American media landscape, in October of that same year, both Vogue Mexico and Vogue Chile featured ordinary indigenous women on their covers. At the same time that Aparicio successfully harnessed her celebrity to advance intersectional issues concerning women's and indigenous rights, her presence was simultaneously met with erasure and backlash. backlash. In the case of English language media, Aparicio is rarely acknowledged as a mistake and tricky woman. Instead, most often she is singularly referred to as a Mexican national. In these ways, her indigeneity is rendered not only invisible, but also unintelligible to English language media outlets. And I get into this issue uh, in more detail, but we won't have enough time today um, with an example of a Jimmy Kimmel interview where the host invokes longstanding tr dominant tropes of the global south as, as, as un of the global south as untouched by globalization and without access to cinema and television. In doing so, Aparicio's body and subjectivity are rendered illegible on the show because they depart so grossly from hegemonic representations of indigeneity rooted in primitivism that assume incompatible cultural difference. And this also is very similar to Anjara Valivia's analysis of Menchu's coverage in English language outlets after she received the Nobel Peace Prize. In addition to erasure in mainstream English language media, Aparicio was also subjected to a backlash in Spanish language media. Similar to Amara la Negra, some Spanish language media outlets circulated disparaging images of Aparicio. In early 2019, Deca Rosales, a television, person, a television personality on the Mexican-owned Spanish language television network Televisa, posted parody photographs of herself dressed as Aparicio at the Oscars on social media, which you can see on the right side of the screen. Wearing brown makeup, a long straight black wig, and a prosthetic nose, Rosales performed Aparicio in brown face, garnering pushback from Latina Latino communities, exhausted by demeaning representations of, of indigeneity in Spanish language television. The incident also recalls earlier Mexican cinematic and televisual brown face performances of indigenous characters. In this presentation, I have argued that Amara La Negra and Yalitza Aparicio perform legible and illegible representational labor in English language and Spanish language media. I demonstrate that Amara La Negra and Aparicio push back against the racial ambiguity and whiteness inherent in mainstream English language, Latina, Latino, and Black media industries, calling instead for racial specificity. Amara La Negra and Aparicio do the critical labor of reconfiguring Latinidad to be racially inclusive. Amara La Negra and Aparicio not only demand symbolic representation in the form of inclusive media depictions, but also illuminate the material erasures of Black and, Lat and Indigenous Latina Latinos through calling attention to structural racism as it functions across the Americas. Representations of Amara La Negra and Aparicio also serve as windows into contemporary renderings of race across the Americas, as both women are navigating racial stratifications embedded in multiple media systems. Both women register differently in English language and Spanish language media because they're brushing up against and also choosing to deliberately intervene in different, though certainly not discreet, racial systems. Furthermore, the representational labor performed by Amara La Negra and Aparicio shed light on mass colonial legacies and historical amnesia that erased Black and Indigenous women within Latinidad. While there is the danger of these two women bearing the burden of representation, I want to end by saying that they do reinvigorate media spaces long in need of Black and Indigenous women's ways of knowing, creative expression, and being in the world. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, um, Jillian, for this fantastic talk. I really uh, learned so much hearing you, and I have so many questions uh, for you. I know I invite the audience to post their questions on the Q&A function on Zoom, um, but I will take the privilege of being moderating of moderating this talk to ask you a first question. Uh, so you talked a bit about this already, but you study uh, here what you call institutional reception, and you also have done extensive research on audience reception. So do you think that um, when it comes to transnational, but mostly US media representations that challenge the stereotypical Latina womanhood representation that you talk about, um, can this bring more awareness of colorism and racism in Latin America? where in many countries, uh, we know that critical discussions around racial hier hierarchies and colorism and racism because of different mestizaje ideologies are less prevalent? Or do you maybe think that maybe these representations are perceived as part of US imaginaries and then um, othered in Latin America? Yeah, I think that that's a really good question. Um, and it's one that that is is I don't want to say difficult to answer, but I will say is layered. And the reason why I say that is because um, when we're talking about a U.S. Latino audience and a Latin American audience, even when we you know are separating those two as as discrete categories, right? Those involve a lot of different segments of the audience, right? <laughs> Who are bringing all sorts of backgrounds and baggage, if you will, right, to their reception experience. And on top of that, too. We're also in a media environment where we're not all consuming the same media, um, and that makes it difficult. So on the one hand, I want to say that, yes, um, I think it is bringing some awareness, particularly because, and I didn't focus um, you know, on this in, in the talk today, but this is certainly like an, a, an aspect of it. Um, you know, there is a lot of chatter you know, circulating on social media, particularly on Twitter um, and also on Instagram. Um, that concerns these women, um, you know, they're used sort of as a, as, as, as a way in which people talk about this, um, but they're larger, you know, much larger conversations, right, about these issues of, of race and racial discrimination um, across the Americas. And I think that those are places where awareness really can happen and people can dialogue about that. But I also want to caution that not everybody is tuned into those discussions. And so much of this is lost. Um, and so I think, you know, we have to start looking in other spaces. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the sort of issues that has been going on that is pretty interesting has been, you know, looking at how Spanish language media in the U.S. has been covering, for example, um, the Black Lives Matter um, protests and the aftermath. Um, and that, I think, has reached a different audience that perhaps is not, you know, engaging um, on Twitter and, and um Instagram or even on Facebook, or they are on those social media platforms, but they're not looking at those kinds of posts. Um, so I think that, you know, that's a really tough question. And then I think we already get into the problem too of questions of, you know, when you're talking about a Latin American audience, you're absolutely right. There can be some resistance about like, are these just like US ways of thinking about, um, you know, who we are um, and how these, how these sort of images and discourses move um, into the US and back and forth. Um, there's a lot that gets lost there. <laughs> and so so it's, a it's a wonderful question and it's something that I think all of us need to invest a lot more um, time and research into answering. Thank you so much. I think that you already gave many answers uh, to this. I think it is fascinating. Um, uh, so I will read a few of the questions that we have received. Uh, Professor Mary Beltran has a couple of questions uh, in regarding how different um, how like media representations might represent or alter skin color in published photographs. Um, and if you have explored this in your case studies and what you're finding, and she thanks you for your terrific presentation. And also have you explored or considered light, lighting of film video segments? Okay. Yeah, I think that that's a really great question um, that also brings in these um, the, these larger issues of production, but also to um, thinking about marketing, how these women are marketed. Um, and I do, you know, I haven't gone in depth into the analysis, but I will say this: there have been um, some cases with both of the women, particularly in terms of um, 
they're, they, when they are, have been shot for magazines, and it's, it's particular to that kind of filming, um, where the, where either audiences or, and this is more so the case with the Mara La Negra talking back to these kinds of images of herself, saying that she has been lightened. With Yalitza Aparicio, it's more her, her fans that have said, why was she lightened in this particular magazine shoot, right? This is not how she really looks. Um, and so, and I think that that definitely gets into these larger questions um, of institutional reception in, in a little bit of a different way um, than I was talking about it for this presentation, but it's, it's a really important question. Thank you so much. Uh, so now I will, I will read a question from Arcelia Gutierrez. Uh, can you talk more about why you read Chalitza Aparicio through the lens of Latinidad? Is this an attempt to decolonize Latinidad's uh, US centricity? or a commentary on how US Latinx audiences or English language media read Aparicio as Latina? Yeah, I think that this is an important question because um, you know, the case of Amara La Negra, she is a US Latina, right? And she identifies as a US Latina, right? She, she has spent almost all of her life in Miami. Um, and that is very different from uh, Yalitza Aparicio, who um, really was, you know, like a Mexican national. Um, and certainly since her time in Roma has spent a lot more time in Hollywood. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm thinking about her more transnationally is because she's talking about herself. She does not call herself Latina though, I will say that. Um, but um, so that's part of it is, is sort of, I think how her identity has kind of been reshifted um, due, to, due to her location in Hollywood. Um, but also, um, I, I, there is also a way in which U.S. Latino audiences have sort of taken her on, right, as, um, as a Latina icon, even though she does not identify that way. And she certainly, of course, um, does not identify as, you know, Chicana or Mexican-American, but really has, has identified herself as Mexican or, you know, or as indigenous Mexican. Um, and so I think that that's a really, you know, a, a really important sort of um, uh, you, uh, I didn't get into this. There's also this campaign, um, hashtag campaign called um, I Am Yalitza, um, which is a really, you know, for those of you who are interested in these questions of reception, it's very interesting because there are both US Latino audiences and also Latin American audiences. Um, you know, obviously, you know, it's called I Am Yalitza. It's, it's all about identification. And some of them are really problematic, I think, in terms of sort of playing Indian and taking on indigenous identities that, um, I'm imagining some of these audiences probably would not have in any other context. Um, you can never be sure with doing that kind of work, but that's the sense that I get. Um, so that's like an illustration. I think if you look, take a look at that particular um, thread, um, of, you can get into sort of the tensions there of, of how people are identifying with Yalitza in ways that she may be identifying with, but in, in ways that, sh that, that appear that she probably doesn't. Yeah. Um... So I have an, another uh, great question. Um, so someone says, I would love to hear more of your thoughts on how each of these performer social media platforms factor into their positioning within transnational popular culture. To what extent does each of them maintaining their own profiles perhaps allow for more control of their own Im images and more nuance to their representations? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, celebrity social media accounts are always complicated because on the one hand, they certainly are a form of, uh, you know, their publicity and sometimes even, um, you know, they, their publicists actually will go through, right, and approve or not approve or, or recraft, right, some of their posts. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. Um, Amara La Negra and Yalita Aparicio um, certainly promote their social media accounts as their account and that they have control over it and they are highlighting issues that they want to. Um, certainly some of it is just, just pure publicity, um, particularly in the case of Amara La Negra who has not achieved the kind of international recognition that Yalitza Aparicio has even though she's had a much longer career. She really uses it um, in two ways. One, as publicity. Um, and two, she also uses it really to talk back <laughs> to, to other coverage, to, to coverage that she does not agree on, um, you know, in terms of herself, right? The way in which different um, folks in the media are representing her, she uses it to talk back. Um, so it's really used in an interesting way. In the case of Yalita Aparicio, um, it is more about, on Instagram and Twitter, it's more about um, her activism. 
Um, most of the posts center around the kind of um, work that she's been doing in terms of indigenous communities, in terms of um, domestic workers' rights, and more recently in terms of um, making sure that COVID information is translated into different indigenous languages. Um, and then it's on her YouTube channel, which is fairly recent that has been, re it, it opened up a few months ago. Um, there she really gets into what is it like to be in Hollywood, <laughs> what is, and those videos appear to be very, they're high production. Um, so on the one hand, I, I don't, you know, they don't feel like, um, you know, the, the more natural, if you will, kind of sort of vlogs of other channels. Um, they are, they do seem like they're produced very carefully and edited very carefully. Um, so I think that they, they that, that plays a different function than even uh, Amara La Negra's um, YouTube channel, which either has her music videos on there, um, which of course are, you know, high production, but also she just sometimes gets on there and just starts talking. Something will happen and she will just go live and record herself. So yeah, so they app, they're they using their social media platforms in very different ways. Uh, thank you. Um, so we uh, have another question um, that says, do you think the stardom or the way that Amara La Negra and Yalitza Aparicio gained global recognition, either through reality TV or a prestigious Academy Award film, influenced how their blackness and indigeneity was perceived in both media markets? I do. And this is something that I, I do write about in the essay. Um, you know, I talk about specifically how Amara La Negra um, you know, I mentioned earlier, she's had a more longstanding career and has really um, struggled in, in some ways to, to remain in the limelight and achieve the kind of recognition that she's wanted to. Um, and, you know, part of that is she operates within what, what we might, you know, what, what some might perceive as, as, you know, lower forms of culture, right? So they really like reality TV, um, the kind of even, you know, working within pop music and reggaeton music. Um, and versus, you know, Yalitza Aparicio, who's had a much shorter career and, and also was not trained, right, as a performer either, right? Um, but because she was recognized in this, you know, for this art house film, right, this award-winning art house film um, with this director, right, that already had um, sort of, you know, a standing, so to speak, right, within sort of this, you know, the high arts in terms of thinking of film as an art, um, she registers very differently. Um, because of that. And I think that that's an important, we have to keep that in mind when we're looking at um, Amara La Negra and Yali, Yali, Yalitza Aparicio side by side. Thank you. Um, so uh, another question around Cleo's role on Roma. Um, Angarad Valdivia asked, Cleo's role blends in domestic labor and indigeneity. Um, I am intrigued by critiques of her overdetermined character when it spoke so loudly to me and others through her silence. So I guess my question is about, are US reviews using a reductive definition of elo eloquence? Can you read that last part? The, yes. Just the last sentence. Mm -hmm. Are US reviews using a reductive definition of eloquence like um, her, her agency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that this gets into that question of like, you know, who, who, uh, who is the audience? And I think that, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, I talk about the institutional reception within English language media, where I think really her agency is not registered at all, at least in terms of, you know, um, the coverage that I looked at um, versus amongst, if you look at, there is a lot of um, audience engagement with her in that role. Um, and that's much more mixed receptions, recognizing that, um, yes, she in many ways um, is rendered silent, but there's so much to be said in that silence. And we need to also really pay close attention to the visual because that's where a lot of her agency resides. Um, but also to even pointing out the fact that she even speaks an indigenous language and we hear it, it is already like, you know, a sonic signifier that most of us have never heard, right? Um, and then in Spanish language outlets, uh, there's a whole other discussion there happening, a nuanced discussion, of, uh, more nuanced about class, right? And looking at it through that particular, and class as it intersects with indigeneity. Um, so I think that, yeah, it, it, it really is registering even, you know, Yalitza, but also her role as Cleo registers really differently amongst these different audiences. Thank you so much. There was a last question about class and wealth, but you already uh, sort of responded to that in your last comment. So I don't know, Pablo, we are right on time. Exactly. That's perfect. I mean, the, the, 
the answer tackled the question that was read and the question that was about to be read. So I couldn't think of a better way of wrapping up uh, today's seminar. Thank you so, so much, uh, Gina. And it was really captivating and analytically very, very uh, enlightening. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Celeste, for a great moderation. Thanks, everybody in the audience, for staying with us to the end. And I invite everybody to join again uh, next Thursday, when we'll have Mari Castañeda from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst uh, at our weekly uh, seminar for Center for Latinx Digital Media. So thank you so much again, and have a great rest of your days.